بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين قال العلامة حجة الإسلام أبو جعفر براق الطحاوي في مصر رحمه الله تعالى هذا ذكر بيان أقيدة أهل السنة والجماعة على مذهب فقهاء الملة أبي حنيفة النعمان بن ثابت ثابت الكوفي وأبي يوسف يأقوب بن إبراهيم الأنصاري وأبي عبد الله محمد بن الحسن الشيباني رضوان الله عليهم أجمعين وما يعتقدون من أصول الدين ويدينون به رب العالمين قال الإمام وبه قال الإمامان المذكوران رحمه الله تعالى ويدينون به رب العالمين If you look at the translation, let's just quickly look at the translation. That's the second picture that Morana uh, is saying. So, in the name of Allah, the, the beneficent, the merciful, praise belongs to Allah alone, to God alone. I, 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 I like to use the word Allah. The Lord of the world, the most learned scholar, the proof of Islam, Abu Ja'far al-Warraq al-Tahawi from Egypt, may Allah shower him with mercy, states that the following is an exposition of the creed of the people of the prophetic way and the majority of the scholars, i.e. Ahl al-Sunnah wal Jama'ah, in accordance, in accordance with the understanding of Muslim jurists such as Imam Abu Hanifa and Nu'man bin Thabit al Kufi. Abu, ya ya Abu Yusuf Yaqub al Ibrahim al Ansari and Abu Abdullah Muhammad al Hassan al Shibani, rahimahullah ta'ala. It includes their beliefs about the theological foundation of the religion upon which they base their worship of the Lord of the worlds. Of the Lord of the, of the, Lord of the worlds. Now, this is a just uh, a root translation of this opening statement of Imam Tahawi. Uh, I want the brothers, if they can, just concentrate on the Arabic. Translation is a bit, uh, it's difficult to understand sometimes. Just uh, Arabic, so we know why the, these words have been used and what they mean. So obviously the first uh, opening line that is, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, Qadil Allama, the, you know, the Allama, the person with the great knowledge, Hujjat to Islam, the evidence for Islam. It's very, very apparent that Imam Tahawi didn't write these. You know, nowadays we have people that write Sheikh, Mufti, I don't know what, what, next to the names. Yeah, but 10 credentials, they have to write people. So, uh, the pious Salaf, they never, uh, they never did this. This is, uh, the, um, afterwards people, they give them these titles based on their status. Like you have the Hujjatul Islam, the evidence of Islam, Imam Ghazali, this was his title. Imam Radi, when the word Al-Imam is mentioned, Inside Aqidah, the word Al-Imam is referring to the great Imam Marazi. Similarly, when the word Shaykh is mentioned inside Aqidah, it's referring to Abu Hassan Ash'ari. Likewise, Al-Ustad, when the word Al-Ustad is mentioned, again in Aqidah, is referring to Al-Ustad ash Similarly, when the word uh, Lisan Al-Mutakallimeen, the tongue of the Mutakallimeen, the theologians, yeah, is referring to Al-Imam Baqillani. Similarly, when it comes to Aqidah and referring to Shaykh al-Islam, is talking to, referring to Imam Subki, Taqiyudun al-Subki. So these are titles that people afterwards they give, like the word Hafid, when it comes in a hadith, and we say the word Hafid, Qal al-Hafid, the Hafid said this is referring to Ibn Hajar al-Sqalani. So these are titles, and it is very, very, uh, very, very obvious uh, that Imam Tahawi didn't write this first line, uh, because, you know, it's actually, uh, it's praising oneself. And this is against the Quranic verse, La tuzakku anfusakum huwa a'alam biman ittaqa. Allah says, do not do tazki yourself, do not exonerate yourself, exonerate your soul from any uh, defects or any problem, uh, any shortcomings. You know? Allah knows who is the most pious amongst us. So it's clear that Imam Tahabi rahmatullahi alayhi never mentioned this uh, because uh, this is... Uh, uh, praising oneself is, uh, is not, uh, you know, is blameworthy uh, inside uh, Islam. However, where his words do start is from the word Hada Dhikru Bayani Aqeelat Ahl Sunnati 
wal jama'at if you look at the arabic text there has this 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 way is referring to this there two possibilities in the word this in arabic language the word hada refers to something that is close by if something that is in close distance you say hada this something that is in distance you say dhalika that yes. basic uh, arabic uh, language hada and dhalik isma ishara the hada this and dhalik that so hada can have two meanings here is either number one hada imam tahawi is saying this yani what i'm going to write which he believes in within his heart and his mind that he's going to write because you know uh, the reason i'm saying heart and mind is because many people when they write something they change as they go along they change a lot of things but down here obviously he's not going to change why because he's actually writing something which he believes in is aqida he's writing aqida so hada is referring to hada i eat this what i believe in this why what i believe in uh, from my heart with my mind this this, this belief that i have it can either mean this is one possibility second possibility is the imam tahawi rahmatullahi ali after writing the entire book then he mentioned this introduction at the end that this what i've written but the second interpretation is is weak the reason to that is weak because then that means that imam tahawi as a when, when he was writing his aqida at the time he wasn't really sure what he's going to write after he had written it then he said all this and a, a great imam like i told you was such a great imam in hadith you know he, this sort of uh, false assumption is you know is not uh, befitting for a person like imam tahawi So the ulama in general, if you look at the commentaries, they will tell you the hada is referring to i.e. those beliefs that I have in my heart and those beliefs that I have in my mind. I believe in my heart and mind. This hada, this this belief. What is this belief? <coughs> What is this? This is the exposition of the creed of the Ahlul Sunnah wal Jamaah. This is the exposition. of the creed of the ahl sunnah wal jamaa bayan exposition explanation okay mention of the aqida the iman the creed of the ahl sunnah and all the points that are going to come now in the book they are all it represents the aqida of the ahl sunnah the sahaba the tabi'in the first three golden generations this is the points that i mentioned Now there's one word in here is actually quite every word I want you to concentrate on but there's one in particular which I want to mention uh, which is very important the word bayan what did Imam Tahawi say that this way he, what he's going to write is an exposition of the aqida of the ahl sunnah and I've been into the introduction of his ahl sunnah wal jamaa etc alhamdulillah that's been uh, a lot of explanation that's why You know the explanation was very important at the beginning. So now when we read, when we say we hear the word Ahlul Sunnah Jamaah, we hear the word Akida, we can relate back to all that uh, that was mentioned in the beginning. Now the word Bayan. What does Bayan in the Arabic language mean? Bayan in the Arabic language means clear explanation. And as the principle, "Ta'arafu al-Ashya bi-adadadiha," that things are recognized through its opponents. Things are recognized through its upon it so bayan what will the opposite of bayan be mujmal what does mujmal mean something that is not clear something that has ambiguity something that has vagueness that's mujmal bayan is something that is clear in explanation it doesn't have no ambiguity it doesn't have no vagueness it is clear there is no need for explanation the reason i'm saying this because a lot of further points to be based on this word bayan and at that time i will tell you like, let's look back what did he say in the beginning what did imam tahawi say in the beginning bayan so this claim by so and so commentator is false why because he said bayan clear explanation so something that is ambiguous is not clear and something that is clear is not ambiguous bayan in another 
another interpretation of bayan is something that it doesn't the uh, the speech itself is self sufficient it doesn't need another speech it doesn't need explanation it's self sufficient okay. now one question here can arise that this text is very concise it's very comprehensive is what 109 points and you know, without the uh, Arabic and the English, you know, it just comes into a few sides, really. Yeah, you can put it into a few sides. So how can this be an explanation? How can this be an explanation? How can it be a detailed explanation? So the answer is very simple. There's something being comprehensive and concise. Yeah. Oh, shall I say, let me reword. Something that is clear in explanation doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be great uh, detail in uh, words and sentences sometimes you have comprehensive speech and it's clear اختصار a kalam speech that is succinct yeah. brief it doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be long it can be very brief it can be cogent to the point and by the same time we'll have clarity so this is not an uh, objection that anybody objects that okay if this is a clear explanation why is it only a few sides you can say you know having a few lines of <coughs> writing it can be clear and uh, sometimes uh, somebody gives you instruction your parents give you instruction your manager gives you instruction they say a few words but it's clear it is they don't have to write a full thesis to make it you know explain it you know sometimes it's very clear so similarly with this to have a dhikru now he was in Misr when he wrote this, as we see from the translation. Yeah, this is an exposition of the Aqidah of the Ahl Sunnah al Jama Aqidah. I mentioned Aqidah, this is a synonym of Iman. Aqidah is like a synonym of Iman. It's been uh, uh, written uh, uh, in a book form as the time of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. People, the further the uh, zamana and the time was distant from Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam new fitness, new corruption start coming so obviously the ulama needed to sit down and actually write books to differentiate between the aqidah of the Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah and those that are not from the Ahl Sunnah those that are from the innovation and kufr and aqidah, the word aqidah is uh, technically or sorry, linguistically the word aqidah is from aqadah ya'qidu aqadah ya'qidu aqadah and what does Aqidah uh, mean? mean? The word Aqidah, Aqidah ya Aqidah means to tie a knot. To tie? To tie a knot. And it's quite obvious that when a person uh, ties a knot, when a person ties a knot, this uh, typifies and it denotes strength. Something that is strong. So down here we are talking about those sets of set of beliefs, those set of beliefs that are strong. Yani a person's heart is strongly tied with them. Aqada means to tie. So we're talking about those set of beliefs that a person doesn't have he doesn't have no doubt, he accepts them with his heart, he actually firmly believes in them. That's why a His main students, he had many students, two of the main students were, or actually the more famous ones, uh, Abu Yusuf, uh, uh, um, Imam Abu Yusuf, yes, and Imam Muhammad bin Hassan, al-Shaybani, rahmatullahi alayhima, they're known as the Sahibain, the two companions of the Prophet uh, of uh, Imam Abu Hanifa. Now, we need to look at these words, Allah madhab fuqaha il milla. <coughs> Imam Tahawi mentioned the word madhab according to the madhab and if you remember briefly before this I mentioned a bit of detail about the word madhab groups of in Aqidah but down here he's saying I am going to explain it through the methodology of Imam Abu Hanifa 
So the, 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 the maqsa, the purpose is same. Everybody believes in these points, but the way they might be explained, the way they might be presented, it is according to the methodology of Imam Hanifa. <coughs> that doesn't mean that the other aqidah of the other Imam is wrong, no. They're also right. The only difference is that their methodology, their approach in explaining the aqidah might be slightly different. Does everybody understand that? It's very important to note the point. The word madhab down here means tariqah. <coughs> and milla down here means... Groups in Aqeedah are Ashaira, Maturidiyah, Ashaira, Maturidiyah, and Athari. I told you these are the three groups inside Aqeedah, and these are the three groups inside uh, uh, Creed. And I told you that they were slightly developed, they were developed after the times of Imam Tahawi, after his time, slightly. So some people, you know, they'll actually, actually ask you this question. And I told you in the beginning that most of the Shafi'i and Maliki school they categorized uh, or classified as Ash'ari and most of the Hanafis as classified as Maturidis and the difference between them is semantic and I told you this in the beginning, I even showed you a book. Uh, most of the Atharis, uh, the, the virtues, they, uh, they follow the Imam Ahmed bin Hamad So some people actually ask you and they will put this sort of confusion in our minds that a brother, you follow Imam Abu Hanifa rahmatullahi alayhi in fiqh. I say, yes, we do. Well, when it comes to aqidah, you are a maturidi or you're an ash'ari. You're a maturidi or you're an ash'ari. I'll explain the terms a bit more in detail. So a person thinks, oh, wait a minute. Interpolation. Yeah, okay, so they were constantly, so I was saying, yeah, so what did they do? They defended the Akida of the Ahl Sunnah, what, what Jama'ah, that's why if you look at the quote of the scholars, I'll give you one quote which will be sufficient, you have the Shaykh al-Islam, Tajin Subki al-Ash'ari, or the Shafi'i, and he's mentioned inside one of his works, Mu'id al-Ni'am wa Mu'id al niqam uh, page 75 he's mentioned aqidah al ash'ari hiya ma tadammanatuhu aqidah abi ja'far al tahawi alladhi talaqaha ulama al madhahib bil qabul wa radawha aqidatan that the aqidah of imam ash'ari or in that perspective even the aqidah of imam maturidi because uh, like uh, ibn asakir has mentioned other scholars that sometimes for abbreviation and for ease they just say ash'ari or ash'ari and they refer it to maturidi also yeah, so they mention one, but they're talking about both of them. The Ghalil one, they just mention one. So they say the Aqidah of Imam Ash'ari, and in that regard, the Aqidah of Imam Mansur Maturidi is that Aqidah of Imam Tahawi. They actually defended the Aqidah of Imam Tahawi, which the Ummah, he's mentioned the Madhahi, meaning the four schools, Maliki, Shafi, and Anafi, Hanbali, the four schools have accepted. All the four schools have accepted the Aqidah of Imam Tahawi. So what did Imam Abu Hassan Ash'ari Maturidi do? What did Imam um, uh, sorry, Abu Hassan Ash'ari and what did Imam Abu Nsur Maturidi do? They defended the Aqidah of Imam Tahawi. Because Imam Tahawi's Aqidah is very brief. Yes, yes, it's sufficient, it's clear, it's cogent, but it's brief. He will mention that the Adab al-Qabr, for example, is Haq. We have. The, 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 regarding the concept of the grave is true. Riyatullah <coughs> subhanahu wa ta'ala haq, observing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, seeing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the beatific observation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Jannah is haq. He's mentioned that. And that's clear. But people afterwards have tried to refuse it. So now you need explanation, you need rebuttal, you need uh, uh, refutation. So for that, Imam Hassan Ash'ari Maturidi, uh, Imam Hassan Ash'ari and Imam Mansur, sorry, Maturidi, what did they do? They defended this, they give uh, logical evidences. Etc. So when you say you're Ash'ari or Maturidi, that doesn't mean you're not following Imam Abu Hanifa Rahmatullah And if you remember in the beginning I said, like in fiqh we have to follow somebody. But Akita we could just say I believe a Muslim is enough. But when it comes to the deviated sects, then what do we do? To differentiate between them we say no. Because we 
uh, from the Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, we take the interpretation of Imam Abu Hassan Ash'ari and Imam Abu Masood Maturi. Why? Because they actually preserve that stance. But normally we don't have to see that. So does that make sense? So when you say, oh, you're an Ash'ari Maturi in Aqeedah and you're not a Hanafi, you say, that's, 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 that's an argument. It's like you're saying, you're from Milton Keynes, but you're not from England. Yeah. So it, it, it doesn't make sense. Ashaira Madri are the ones that defended the Aqeedah of Imam Tahawi, like the scholars have mentioned. So it's a very important point uh, that we need to take note here. The people do say this, that, you know, uh, why do you, yes, we are Hanafi in Aqeedah, if you look at that term, just Imam Abu Hanifa's Aqeedah, and our Aqeedah is not different. Like Imam Abu Hassan Ashri's Aqeedah, Imam Abu Hanifa's is not different. And Imam Abu Musul Maturidi, who's a, uh, who's a, he was an actually, he was the one, the pioneer when it came to the Hanifi school, the Aqeedah. Imam Abu Hanifa, he had his Aqaid, but the person that actually defended it uh, more in detail and represented the Aqaid in more elaboration was Imam Abu Musul Maturidi. He basically, you can say, he was the lisan, he was actually the tongue, the interpreter of Imam Abu Hanifa's Aqeedah. So Imam Abu Hanifa, he didn't uh, dwell that much into uh, Aqeedah, even though he was a Mutakallim, which I'm going to explain inshallah later on. But uh, yeah, this is uh, like a brief, uh, you know, I want to mention about this. And he's mentioned these three figures. Now, the reason he's mentioned these three figures is because these three personalities, Alhamdulillah, the ulama of the Ummah, they've accepted them, they've accepted their piety, and they've accepted their knowledge. Yeah? These are figures that the, the Ummah, uh, for example, let, let's just look at one figure from there. Let's look at the last student, the last person that was mentioned. Not Imam Abu Hanifa, not Imam uh, Abu Yusuf. Let's look at Imam Muhammad bin Hassan, rahmatullahi alayhi. Right? He was a student of Imam Abu Hanifa. He was a teacher of Imam Shafi'i. And Imam Shafi'i is the teacher of Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal, and Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal is the teacher of Imam Bukhari, so you can just realize where Imam Abu Hanifa stands when it comes to teachers. Right? I mean, Alama Dhabi is mentioned, and other ulama have mentioned that Imam Muhammad bin Hassan, he was so eloquent in speaking. Now, when he would speak, the scholars would say that as though the Quran was revealed in his language. Imam Shafi is mentioned in one narration that the knowledge that I've taken from Imam Abu, uh, uh, Muhammad bin Hassan is equivalent to the books of a Kamal, the way to, that's how much knowledge I've taken from him. He has written two books, al Jami al-Saghir and Jami al-Kabir, Imam Muhammad. And... Uh, Allah Akbar. Imam Muhammad, Rahmatullahi Alayhi, after writing these two books, a Jewish rabbi, he read these two books and he accepted Islam. So somebody asked him, why have you accepted Islam? He said, after reading these two books, I realized that there's so much haq and there's so much truth inside the works of Imam Muhammad, that if this is your Imam Muhammad, a saghir, the small Imam the Muhammad, how is your big Muhammad going to be, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? And if you look at these people, their, their prayer, their knowledge, their taqwa, their piety. You know, in, in, in hadith, if you look at these people, I mean, Imam Abu Yusuf, the other student, he only, he knew 20,000 fabricated ahadith. He knew this many fabricated ahadith, these are fabricated. He learned them to know that these are fabricated. So imagine how many authentic ahadith he knew. So these are two students, and they're the, like the grand teachers of the muhaddithun that came after, Imam Bukhari, Imam Muslim, that came well after. Yeah. Imam Abu Yusuf, rahmatullahi alayhi. Imam Abu Yusuf, Allahu Akbar, again. He was a student of Imam Abu Hanifa, this is one of the people, he mentioned three, Imam Abu Hanifa and Imam Abu Yusuf, Abu Yusuf. He's the first Qadi al Qudat, first chief justice in the Islamic history. Yeah. Chief justice, he got the first person who got the title of Chief Justice Qadi al right? in the time of Harun Rashid, when the Islamic Empire spread throughout the world, approximately three quarters of the world, give and take. <coughs> the Chief Justice of this was who? Abu Yusuf. And this man, Imam Abu Yusuf, rahmatullahi you know today, Allah forgive the Muslim Ummah, you know, people don't have time to read Salah. Why? Because they've got their job nine to five. Nine to five, they do a job. What do you do during the day? Maximum nine to five job. Probably have one car, one house, take it by five houses. One or two cars. And that's about it, that's it. And if a person is working and is very busy, if he's a solicitor somewhere, he's in a court, then it's very difficult to get a meeting with him. Never mind, you know, anything else. This person is 
Qadi al-Qadari, no joke, he's, he's chief justice. An Islamic empire, the entire empire. Now a person is in a small house, three, four bedroom, and it's like the whole world on top of his head. Busy car, I haven't got time for anything. Why? Because children and house and car and work. People are done. This person was a, subhanAllah, Abu Yusuf. Qazi Khuda, Chief Justice, I'm just talking about one aspect of his worship. He would read 300 rakat nafil every day. 300 rakat nafil? Now we can't comprehend this because we do have barakah in our time. We can't read one barakah in the Quran a day properly. 300 rakat for this. So these people were great people. You know, these, uh, that's why Imam Taha always mentioned these three people uh, because they represent uh, the, the, the Ahlul Sunnah Wal Jama'ah. The reading scholars of the Ahlul Sunnah Wal Jama'ah. And Imam Abu Hanif was a Tabi'i. Imam Abu Hanif didn't know his introduction. He was a Tabi'i. So the most authentic opinion that he's seen the Sahaba. So these are from the first generation, they are the Khairul Qurun, the best of people, the Prophet said, the best of people are my people, my nation, and those that follow, and those that follow. These are the people that we're supposed to follow. These are the people that are, uh, you know, Uswa, they are our uh, uh, role models, and they are our examples when it comes to the matters, matters of team. Now, moving forward, another... From here, we can have another uh, sort of uh, a discussion which is related to this and is to do with the Ashaira Maturidiyya because this will also come later on. Uh, but before I move on to the, if you say, وَمَا يَعْتَقِدُونَ مِنْ أُصُولِ Deen. Yeah. That this uh, discourse and this exposition is according to the Aqidah of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah upon the methodology of the jurist of the deen, yeah, the three, and then he said, وَمَا يَعْتَقِدُونَ مِنْ أُصُولِ الدِّينَ and what they believed in from the foundation of the deen. So these are the foundation of the deen. The next 109 points I was going to mention, these are the foundation of the, of the deen. Now, usul foundation, what is the foundation of the deen? What does it mean when you say the word foundation of the, of the deen? Usul as in Asal, again I mentioned between Usuli and Furu'i. Similar, Imam Babarti, inside his commentary of Aqita, how he's defined this, that why is the principle of the deen? The principle of the deen are those things that are related with the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the names and attributes of Allah, and are related with the ahwal and the situation of some of the creation, like the angels, the prophets. Akhirah, the barza, the qabr and beyond. So these are some of the fundamental things that are mentioned in the hadith of Jibreel Iman. Allah, with Allah, attributes, his qualities and attributes. The prophets, all of the prophets, especially the issue with Khatmi Nabuwa, the final prophet in the Misr of the final prophet comes to the books, all of the books, believing in them, and then the discussion about the Qur'an, etc. The Qur'an is being preserved, etc. And then when it talks about the, uh, the life after death, and there includes the grave, includes beyond the day of uh, Hisab Kitab. So these are all from the Usul of the Deen. But we have to remember that if a person re rejects the Usul of the Deen, if a person rejects the usul, the principle of the deen. It's not necessary that he become a kafir. Depends on what he rejects. So, so it depends what he rejects. Why? Because sometimes an issue might be from the usul of the deen because it's established from the, uh, uh, you know, from the usul of the deen but because the evidence is not definitive, it's part of the usul of the deen but because it's not definitive, a person does not become kafir. Let me, let me give you an example. The life of the prophets in the grave. The life of the prophets in the grave. The life of the prophets in the grave, you know, the Prophet hears the uh, salutation that we send. This is from the usul of the deen. In the sense that it's from, it's related with the iman, etc. Prophets. But because it's not established from that, established from definite <coughs> evidence, definitive evidence, yaqini, a person who refuses this will not become a kafir. Yes, it will be a mu'tadi. <coughs> So this is a very large topic, you know, doing the calling people kafir is a very grey area, there's been 
so many books written, etc. I don't want to go into that. I just want to mention regarding Usul al Deen. That it's not necessary that if a person refuses Usul al Deen, he's a kafir. Similarly, it's not necessary that if a person refuses Faru of the Deen, he stays a Muslim. Like, for example, Salah. Is Salah from the Usul or the Faru? It's from the Faru, isn't it? Salah is it's not, it's not mentioned in the Iman. No. It's from the fruit of the thing, Salah. But if anybody refuses the obligation of Salah, what does it become? A kafir. So what, what I'm trying to explain to you brothers and sisters is that usul of deen, the principles of deen, and then you have the subsidiary issues. When it comes to calling somebody kafir, this is a very a, a severe topic. A person should be very, very careful here. Very careful. I don't want to go into the usul of takfir. But my purpose, uh, what I'm trying to say here, that it's not necessary that if a person refuses the principle of deen, that he becomes a kafir. Like, it's not necessary that a person refuses the fruit of deen, he stays a Muslim. وَمَا يَعْتَقِدُونَ مِنْ أُصُولِ الدِّينِ And, وَيَدِينُونَ بِهِ رَبَّ الْعَالَمِينَ And what they obviously have made as their deen, and what they use as to worship as their Rabb, the creator of all of the universe, yeah, all of the universes, all of the worlds. Now, uh, down here, there's one issue which I'd like to mention at the end, inshallah. Now, actually, this, uh, that would be the perfect time. And then, inshallah, from next week, we can actually start the first point. Uh, we'll, we'll say the first point now for Barakat. Yeah? So, at least. So, it says, قَالِ الْإِمَامُ وَبِهِ قَالِ الْإِمَامَاءِ مَذْكُورًا رَحِمَهُمُ اللَّهُ وَتَعَالَى It says, the Imam said, which Imam? Imam Abu Hanifa and the two aforementioned Imam which Abu Yusuf and Muhammad they both said and we say now obviously I am transmitting what they believed in Naqul we say regarding the oneness of Allah the Tawheed of Allah Mu'taqidina having firm belief Allah by the Tawfiq and the ability of Allah I say transmitting from the three Imams regarding the oneness of Allah the Inna Allah Ta'ala Wahid that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one la sharika la without any partner. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one without any partner. So alhamdulillah we started the first point as barakat. After this the points are very easy, there's not much elaboration. Uh, but the last five, ten minutes I want to explain something very very important. Which is again a misconception amongst people and is related to this and is related to the actual kitab book also. Is regarding ilmul kalam. Ilmul Kalam. And when I'm talking about ilm and kalam, I'm talking about dialectical uh, uh, and uh, uh, speculative theology. Uh, ilm and kalam that's based on rational, based on logic. And if you remember, uh, brothers, in the beginning, I mentioned regarding uh, al ashaira and Maturidiyya. When the Ashaira and Maturidiyya came along, they used ilm and kalam. Ilm and kalam is logic in simple terms. When you use speech, you use aql to establish aqaid issues. Establish aqaid issues. I mentioned the story about Imam Ghazi, written a full book where he actually uh, established the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through aqidah uh, and through, uh, 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 sorry, through logic and rational. Now, some brothers, they say, or ilmul kalam, you know, this is bid'ah, it's innovation, it's against the deen. You know, you're not supposed to use rational when it comes to iman, when it comes to aqidah. It's just supposed to be belief, and there's no contemplation, there's no thinking. And they use certain statements, and uh, this is probably the first report that I would like to do on Ibn Izz al-Hanafi. And Ibn Izz al-Hanafi, the Allah alam, he was Hanafi, he has mentioned uh, on page 18, some of the aqwal statements of the pious salaf who have re reprimanded uh, ilmul kalam and ilmul kalam is very bad. And one of them, a uh, statement from Imam Abu Yusuf himself, the one that we just read about Imam Abu Yusuf, uh, the narration by Imam Abu Yusuf who says uh, regarding ilmul kalam that whoever studies kalam, this is ignorance, and whoever doesn't study ilmul kalam, this is ilm. Right? And in one narration, he says regarding uh, ilmul kalam that whoever man talab al ilma bil kalam tazandaqa that whoever studies ilmul kalam theological uh, science 
dialectical, yeah, speculative science, whatever you want to call it, that he is doing, he's committed the crime of heresy. Right? And he's also mentioned a quote from Imam Shafi, so Imam of Yusuf, and then he's quoted a uh, quote from Imam Shafi, Ibn Izz al Hanafi has, that uh, Imam Shafi said, My ruling regarding Ilm al Kalam is that whoever indulges themselves in, inside Ilm al Kalam, he should be beaten up with uh, branches and shoes and they should be put onto a, uh, you know, a donkey and taken around the city and you know basically humiliated and you get stated from that is so basically what they do is that ilm al-kalam is totally bad and like this what they do a shair maturidiyah deviated people why because they used ilm al-kalam so now there's a few things regarding ilm al-kalam number one is this true is ilm al-kalam reprehensible is it bad number one number two was there a need to do this number three is it proven from the Quran and Sunnah number four what are the answers to these statements from the Salaf then <coughs> what are the answers to the statements from the Salaf those people that reprimanded Ilm al-Kalam like Imam Yusuf as al Hanafi has clearly mentioned Imam Yusuf and Imam Shafi what are the answers to this so let me first Tell you what is the purpose of Ilm al Kalam? I said Ilm al Kalam is, is it bad or not? What is the purpose? What is the maqsad? Why was Ilm al Kalam made? The science of Ilm al Kalam was made. The reason Ilm al Kalam was made was to establish evidence, establish logical evidence on the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his attributes, his qualities, and the general rest of the Iman issues. So the purpose of Ilm al Kalam was to establish logical reasoning. Logical reasoning. Like Quran with the hair. In Quran, Allah says He's one. Allah says in the Quran that He has no partner. Allah said the Prophet is the true Prophet. But establishing logical evidence for this, logical reasoning, this is the purpose of Ilm al Kalam. This is the purpose. Now a person, if you look at the purpose of something, he can decide for himself if it's a bad thing or a good thing. Yeah. Is that a bad thing or a good thing? No, without looking at the Quran and this for now, just itself, is it a bad thing or a good thing? Establishing logical evidences. It's a good thing. This moves on to the second point which I made was that why? Why? Why was this done? My brothers, we have to understand that every time and eater, there is need for different different things. In the time of Imam Bukhari, there was need of compiling the hadith. So Imam Bukhari compiled the hadith. Did the Sahaba compile the hadith the way Imam Bukhari did or Imam Malik did? It was a, it was a, there was a need. It was a need. I mean, in the time of Imam Rali, for example, at that time it was, you know, the fitna was crazy. Imam Ghazali, people, ph philosophers, they were actually using philosophy and ilmul kalam, mantik logic, to disapprove the Quran, to disapprove the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So to combat this, to refute this, Ilm al Kalam was used. Ilm al Kalam was used. And to contemplate in evidences. What is Ilm al Kalam? Ilm al Kalam is to establish evidences, is to logically use your mind and give rational. Isn't that in the Quran? Allah said, Fa'atabiru ya al basar. The other people of intellect think. Allah says, Nurihim ayatina fil afaq. Allah will show us signs in the horizon, in the afaq. And Allah will show us signs within ourselves. In through contemplation, if a person contemplates in the creation of Allah, if a person contemplates in his own self, he will realize that Allah, this is haq, this is true from Allah. Allah is true. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil All praise to Allah who is the Lord of all of the universes. Al Alam Alameen is actually from Alim. Uh, alim, alim is a uh, scale as known as Ism Allah, meaning a tool. Okay? Ism Allah is a tool. Yani, the universe is a tool for us to recognize Allah. So, Alam is from ilm, knowledge. By contemplating in the Alam, we get the ilm of the creator of the Alam. People who contemplate in the creation of the heavens and the earth, they will say, Rabbana ma Allah, you haven't created this in vain. There's a purpose. 
So contemplating in uh, the, the, in the world, the things that we have around us, in order to get to the conclusion or in order to support the argument of the Creator that the Creator exists, this is something that is there in the Quran. Okay, it might not directly be there, the Ilmul Kalam, but the concept is there. Does that make sense? Yeah, so, ilm, so, number one, the purpose of Ilmul Kalam is noble. Number two, it's from the Quran. The Quran has encouraged us again and again to use our logic, to use our rationale. Okay. And number three, now this is the, the main part, uh, and, and it was, number three, is, it was a necessity. It was a necessity. I mean, if somebody comes with a logical argument, you need to give a logical answer. You can't say to him, oh, it says in the Quran, that's his stay quiet. That's why the ulama say the sound intellect is not against the Quran hadith. A sound intellect, fitr, a person's nature, sound intellect, he will definitely agree to the concept of Quran hadith. Everybody, anybody with a sound intellect. Alhamdulillah, Allah give hidayah to many people. Many great people Allah give hidayah to. Why? Because Allah gives them sound intellect. Sound intellect will actually agree to the concept of Quran hadith. Yes, if a person's aql is kharab, there's deficiency inside his aql, then that's another, another matter. That's why there is not any ruling of the Quran hadith that's against sound intellect. And now, subhanallah, I was starting to say, Mufti Musa sahab, now to understand uh, 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 Quran, uh, understand Aqidah and Ilmul Kalam uh, is, is so easy in the time of technology. Now, people like the Mu'tazilites, uh, the group that one of the deviated groups, what, one of their concepts, they, they, they refuse that actions can be measured. The actions can't be weighed on the day of judgment. They say, look, action is something that's tangible, it's something that's got, it hasn't got a body shape, it's not, it's not, uh, it's not corporeal, it's, it's just a modality, it's there, it's, it's a meaning, it's a ma'ana. How can be something like this? Like, I mean, you can't get salah in a form, shape, and weigh on the day of judgment. You can't get salah and measure it. This is the reason, this is the rationale that the Mu'tazila used. And because of this, what happened? They deviated. Now, in the time of technology, Alhamdulillah, I was telling you, you can understand anything. Everything is measured nowadays. Speed is measured. Everything, you know, sugar, you got this man. Can you take a doctor, take a spoon of sugar, are you burning your legs? Sugar. No. Everything is measured, everything can be analyzed. People say, oh, how can you, how can five people, or how can ten people, or how can hundred people simultaneously see the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? I mean, the boxing match that a lot, lot of people watched last night, how did so many people watch that simultaneously? Or the football game people watch? The game is in Manchester, but so many people watch across the world. How did they do it simultaneously? So Alhamdulillah, in the time of technology, this was Sahaba, Alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar. What Iman that they have without any technology, without any reason, they accepted the Iman. Today we have, it's so easy for us. So that's Ilmul Kalam. And the other thing is, if we're going to say Ilmul Kalam, the reprehensible life is that there's so many scholars of the Ummah, the who have written commentaries of Bukhari, Muslim, who we cannot understand the Quran and Hadith without them. They use Ilmul Kalam and try to say they're all Na'udhu Billah deviated. Every, if this will not be an exaggeration, that there is, and nobody can understand the Quran, nobody can understand Bukhari and Muslim without the help of Ashair and Maturidiyah, who, were, who use Ilmul Kalam. So that means, Na'udhu Billah, the people who safeguarded the, uh, the, the words of Allah, who Allah used, who Allah used as a means to safeguard His words, and who Allah used to safeguard the words of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they were, Na'udhu Billah, deviated. This is a very big accusation against the ulama of the ummah. And the, the final point which, Imam, uh, which Ibn Iz has mentioned inside his commentary, Ibn Iz has mentioned inside his commentary, uh, the two statements from Imam Abu Yusuf and uh, Imam uh, Shafi'i regarding uh, the Imam, uh, what's it called, uh, Ilmul Kalam is reprehensible and a person shouldn't uh, uh, use Ilmul Kalam and he, if, he does, if he use Ilmul Kalam, he's a heretic and uh, in one narration uh, from Imam Abu Yusuf, Imam Hanifa, that a person shouldn't read Salah behind a person who indulges inside Ilmul Kalam. The answer to this is, in a very uh, summary, this is a lot of detail about the last inshallah, two minutes, is that the statements that have been mentioned regarding Imamul Kalam, that is talking about a specific type of Imamul Kalam. And what is the evidence for this? The evidence is that similar statements have been mentioned from the same Imams praising Imamul Kalam. 
from Imam Abu Yusuf and Imam Shafi'i, they are statements from Imam Abu Yusuf, Rahmatullahi Alayhi, and Imam Shafi'i, who is referred to them, Aimmatul Ilm, that the people who indulge inside Ilmul Kalam, they are the Imams of knowledge from Imam Abu Yusuf, from the same Imams that people quote, uh, refuting Ilmul Kalam, the same Imams have praised Ilmul Kalam. So obviously there's a context now. Obviously there's a Content. The context is that wherever the statement, this is a general principle, we can inshallah use the principle anywhere you find a statement that those Imams, those pious <laughs> Salaf that reprimanded Ilmul Kalam, that is in a certain context. It's talking about that Ilmul Kalam which is against Quran and Sunnah. It's talking about pure Greek philosophy. Pure Greek philosophy which was just based on rational. They had no textual evidence, no revelation, nothing. The Mu'tazilites, for example. Mu'tazilites were, they indulged so much in Ilm al-Kalam that they just, they started refute, you know, rejecting Quran, uh, ayat of the Quran and ahadith, of not rejecting, openly rejecting, but inter inserting uh, such interpolations which actually changed the apparent meaning of the verse or the text. So you're talking about a specific type of Ilm al-Kalam. Whereas the Ilm al-Kalam, the, the ulama and the ash'ayr and maturidi have studied, <coughs> subhanallah, that Ilm al-Kalam was there to defend the Quran and Sunnah was a tool to defend the Qur'an and Sunnah. It wasn't there to be used against the Qur'an and Sunnah. So to Ilm al-Kalam that is used against the Qur'an and Sunnah, like the Greek philosophy, that is, yes, heresy. That is, yes, what Imam Shafi'i said. That is, is uh, you know, uh, a person should be, you know, hit with a jarid and ni'al and you should be the tawaf, you know, on, on, in, in the city. Yes, that's that, that, that Ilm al-Kalam. Uh, that's why uh, Ilm al-Kalam, the final point in Ilm al-Kalam is, is theological. Uh, is when you, uh, you, know, you debate and you discuss rationally. And this is in the Quran. What did Allah say? Wa jadilun billati hiya? I said, no, a lot of people say we shouldn't debate. This is our, you know, if you have a debate, yes, debate has got a lot of conditions, sincerity, etc, etc. I don't want to go into Imam Ghazali, if you read it about, regarding the thing he said about debate, you think, you know, I'm not, never going to debate in my life. But because it is scary, intention, etc. has to be correct. But the Quran says, do mujadala with the people, with the best way. Mujadala, Imam Ibn Kathir mentioned Mujadala here means Munadara, debate. Imam Ibrahim al Islam debated with how, uh, uh, King uh, Nabrud. Okay. What happened when Nabrud called him? He said, You know, who, who do you believe is? I believe Allah is my Lord. And He is the Lord that you you meet. What does He do? He gives life and He gives death. Nabrud said, Right, okay. He called a person, give him. Two people, one he killed and one he left free. He said, Look, I know he will meet. So Ibrahim said, Okay, now we give evidence. Now, this is a logical evidence. Al Ibrahim, Fa'in Allah Yati, Bishamsi Midan Mashriq, Fa'ati Biha Midan Maghrib. That Allah, He makes the sun come out from the Mashriq. You try to do this. You make him out from the Maghrib. Fabuhitel Nadi Kafara. He was perplexed, he was like dazzled. So this was what? This was a logical argument. Yeah? This is a logical argument. So Ilm al-Kalam, in this perspective, and if you look in the Quran, so that having a di uh, uh, intellectual discussion, a munadhara debate, it depends on the intention, it depends on the method. Like in the Quran, at uh, one place, this has been praised, like, هَذَانِ خَصْمَانِ اخْتَصَمُوا فِي رَبِّهِمْ هَذَانِ خَصْمَانِ اخْتَصَمُوا فِي رَبِّهِمْ The two people that debated and they came to uh, Dawood so that debate was is being praised why because it was done in the right way but in the same place uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about uh, the people of Quraysh Balhum Qawmun Khasimun they are people that just debate and argue that down there was bad why because their intention were wrong their approach was wrong so but to have an honest discussion a fruitful discussion for the sake of Allah without patronizing each other without belittling each other and doing it with the right way, this is a way forward. You know, if two parties sit down, rather I believe this, that not to have an honest discussion, yeah? Not to have a discussion, this is worse. Why? Because when you don't have a discussion and you just keep it all in and people start backbiting and anybody grows, whereas if you're open, you're transparent, you sit down, the method is correct, you agree to disagree, this is actually a way forward. So Ilm al-Kalam, if you're doing it with the right context, the right intention, the ulama have done it in the past, it is needed, it is a tool. Yeah. 
And it will not be an exaggeration to say that it's amongst the best sciences. Why? Because through Ilmul Kalam, what are you doing? I mean, through Tajweed, you're preserving the letters of the Quran. Through the science of Hadith, you are preserving what? The words of the Prophet. Through Ilmul Kalam and Aqeedah, uh, Ilmul Kalam is also known as Aqeedah. Al-Aqeedah. This is also a synonym. So uh, later on, scholars they refer to Aqeedah Ilmul Kalam. This is a science that is there to preserve the Aqeedah, the Iman of the Ummah. And that's what the scholars did. When the Mu'tazila start using rational, Ashaira Maturidiyah, they give them answers back based on their principles. Like the great Fakhr Razi, he comes in narration that when he would, I mean, debate the philosophers, the philosophers would stand and just begin to quiver and tremble. Why? Because he would actually knock them out based on their principles, using the same signs. So this is Ilmul Kalam. And the reason I mention this because Afterwards, there will be certain words that we use, that, uh, the Ilmul Kalami words, and then you will see the commentary that will say, you know, this is Ilmul Kalam, we should use this word. We, Imam Taha, we used it, but you know, we shouldn't use it, that sort of thing. So that's why I wanted to mention on Ilmul Kalam. And Imam Abu Hanifa, Rahmatullah before he studied fiqh, he was a mutakallim, he, he, would, he actually advised his uh, son to study Ilmul Kalam. But then a point came where he told his son, do study Ilmul Kalam. So he said, wait a minute. You used to tell me to study Ilmul Kalam and now you tell me not to study Ilmul Kalam. He goes, yeah, because when, I, when, we used to study, when we used to use Ilmul Kalam, we used to be so scared that as though a bird is sitting on our head that we can't move, meaning we were so under pressure, very careful when we speak. Nowadays people, they use Ilmul Kalam, why? So the opponent can slip. The opponent can slip. And Imam Bhanifa said, why? Because if a person, if he's waiting for his opponent to make kufr, He's committed kufr before his opponent has. Why? Because he's happy with his kufr. Obviously, this is a context again. Imam Abu Hanifa said this as a caution, as a, as, as, as a love for his son. For his son. That, you know, uh, be careful. And obviously, uh, even uh, if a person does a debate and he wants his obviously opponent to be, you know, wipe his opponent out, that doesn't mean he's doing kufr. It doesn't mean he's doing kufr. Obviously, if a person, uh, if he's happy with kufr, that's a different, but nobody's happy with kufr. But some scholars say now, no, sometimes it's actually necessary to knock the opponent out. Why? Because the opponent, he's adamant on his views. He is actually made, he's made his mind up. He's a fitna. He is misleading. He's got a following. He's misleading people. Now it's necessary to, you know, make him fall. So people know that he, he has no foundation to stand on. He has no basis. So these are the few things regarding... Uh, Ilmul Kalam and Imam Hanifa in his uh, book that's attributed towards him, Al Fiqh Al Akbar, Al Alim Al Muta'allim. These are books that have been written on Il, uh, in Ilmul Kalam. So, from the pious of Ilmul Kalam, uh, uh, is there. And the irony is that those people who, uh, uh, you know, who uh, reprimand Ilmul Kalam, uh, they use uh, Imam uh, Sheikh Ibn Taymiyyah Rahmatullahi Alayhi. And Sheikh Ibn Taymiyyah Rahmatullahi Alayhi, he's also uh, in uh, places where he's refuted Ashaira and Maturiyat, Ilmul Kalam, with his own Kalam. So he's a mutakallim in his own league. He's actually refuted Imam Razi, for example, uh, in uh, Bayanat al Jahmiyyah, where he's actually just refuted Imam Razi, Asas al Taqdis, sorry, in his uh, book, uh, uh, the refutation of Imam Razi, uh, sorry, the book of Imam Razi, Asas al Taqdis. Ibn Taymiyyah has refuted him and he said, oh, he's used Kalam, Kalam, etc. And the reason to this is, is so then to refute Imam Razi's Kalam, Ibn Taymiyyah used his own Kalam. So I mean, it's necessary sometimes to prove somebody uh, logic wrong, you, you have to use logic in, in refutation. So this is quite, you know, it's, it's, it's normal, it's quite obvious. So here these are a few things regarding Ilm al-Kalam. And Ilm al-Kalam is a science that protects the Iman and the Aqeedah. Uh, Aqeedah, Ilm al-Kalam are uh, more or less uh, synonyms. Uh, inshallah, first point, in Allah Ta'ala, Wahid, Allah Ta'ala is one, there is no partner with him. Inshallah, the points will be easy now. We can, uh, inshallah, just uh, hopefully... Uh, fly through them, inshallah, as they say. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, keep us steadfast upon the, uh, the true aqeed, the true iman. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us death upon iman and amal. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make this uh, sitting that we, alhamdulillah, had uh, means of benefit, a means of salvation uh, in this life and the akhirah. Uh, if, inshallah, if life permits and we have time, inshallah, and everybody, if we have health, inshallah, we will continue this. Inshallah, next week. May Allah keep us united in this life. May Allah keep us united in this life. And Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen.